Good morning, fellas. We're in the brewery on Tuesday, and uh, it's time for us to make some best bitter. We're running a little bit, a little bit low in the pub, so I thought I'd uh, get the camera out, maybe set it up somewhere. I don't know. I don't actually think I've got a tripod for it here, but we'll have a look. And uh, I just thought I'd run through the first things that I do when I arrive. I've probably done it in the past, but I can't quite remember. So when I come in, obviously the HLT has been on, uh, it's been set to come on overnight. Let me turn the camera around. So the HLT has been set to come on overnight. We've set it to 78 degrees. As you can see, we're 0.4 of a degree off there. So that's ready to go. Yesterday, Gemma and I put all of the grist into the mash tun so I'll just take the lid off the mash tun pop it over here and the very first thing that I usually do when I come in is get that mash started no hanging around so a couple of things I've got to do before I fill the mash tun up I've got to make sure it's in the right position before we put a few hundred kilos of water in there I just need to be a few inches away from this pipe so I can get my uh, brewery hose through there so we'll just give this a bit of a nudge across and then that looks to be in the right position the reason I do that is because I've got this supply hose from the mash tun and it needs to reach down to this fitting so that's ready we've got all the grist in the top as you can see we've got crystal malt we've got pale malt we don't however yet have any water treatment in there I do that during the transfer. So what I'm going to be doing is set my water meter for 220 litres and run it. We've got a couple of ISO valves here. That's for the recirculation into the top of the tank so we don't get stratification with the heating. And this is the feed through that hose and into the mash tun through there so while that's filling up and it will take a while as you can see we're flowing between 11 and 12 liters per minute so we've got 10 minutes or so before that happens and in that time I'm gonna go over here uh, I could do a tidying this area up actually from where I've been cutting some pump clips out on this self-healing mat but we're gonna get our Marsden scales out which are trading standards approved and you know that because of this little sticker on the side and we're going to weigh out 350 grams of AMS 222 gram, uh, 122 grams of calcium chloride and 177 grams of calcium sulfate your water treatment may differ I also want 50 ml of lactic acid in the mash as well to help with the pH so I'm going to do that off cam and we'll come back. So we've got our AMS and lactic in there. I've already added the dry water treatment to the mash tun. And then one thing I always do is clean down the surfaces after I've used the ANS because it is actually destructive to stainless steel. You see all this staining on the stainless? That is from splashes of ANS. Or AMS depending on which brand you buy let's move that to one side push these valves out of the way you can see all these little pop marks on the stainless that's all from AMS splashing and uh, it's it, yeah it corrodes stainless steel I'm not sure why it's got sulfuric acid in it so maybe that's the key um, and then also I've had to get a new cloth out when I got the new cloth out from my little store under there this is the last one so it's always good practice to have yourself a little shopping list which I do here we've got a hardware shopping list here for stuff to do with the workshop and then we've got a brewing shopping list up the top so dishcloths have gone on there that way I know I've used the last one I'm responsible for getting the next set so we're gonna wait until there's some actual liquid showing in the mash tun before we add our acids um, in the meantime the boil kettle itself because it's been stood it was clean when I left it 
but we filled it up yesterday with some caustic and we recirculated that through the whole tank and through the plate chiller so what I need to do now is rinse out this caustic it was fine being left in here overnight of course it's just sat in the pipework doing its thing don't do that if you're using a uh, caustic that's got hypochlorates in there because it will damage your seals and the stainless as well this is just sodium hydroxide we're fine so what I'm going to do is drain the bottom of this tank I'm going to push some water through the plate chiller and then I'm going to give it three or four rinses with fresh water and then we're going to put some Persid 15 in there at the right amount at the right dose which is only about a pump of that Persid 15 per, per bucket. It's very concentrated stuff. Then we're going to recirculate that through all the pipe work and make sure everything is sanitary. We've cleaned it with a cleaner, with a caustic cleaner. We're rinsing it and now we're going to sanitize it with an acid sanitizer. And this sanitizer is a no rinse sanitizer. So you just have to drain down the vessel and any residue that's on there is absolutely harmless and it breaks down into acetic acid and oxygen and uh, it's at such low levels what's on the side of the tank it makes virtually no difference undetectable almost so I'm going to empty this off cam because it's noisy and I need two hands and you'll probably see me in a moment when we're putting some Persid in there I actually thought it might be interesting for you to see how I rinse this down to make sure we're caustic free before we introduce any acid. It's really quite simple so I connect my hose to the back outlet of the plate chiller. So this is actually where the beer goes into the plate chiller but doing it this way allows me, I've got this little outlet on the back here, it allows me to reverse flow through the plate chiller. So. I can come, I'm not doing that today by the way, but just for posterity's sake, I can come out of here, I can come up through there, through this outlet here, and we can go into the back side of the plate chiller, uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here aren't I, we can flow it up here, we can go into the top of the plate chiller which is the reverse, and then we come out of there, and then around with this red hose around and then back into the boil tank so we're reverse flushing the plate chiller but we're not doing that today we don't need to reverse flush it today what we're doing at the moment is we're rinsing so I've connected up my hose which is on my hose reel which is in turn connected to the mains so we're going to open this up this is going into the back of the plate chiller we'll turn the water on full now this water can be directed one of several ways. I want to rinse out the whole of this plate chiller first. So we'll prevent it coming up this pipe. Now it can't enter the pump from this direction. It has to go through the plate chiller, out this top section. It'll run down here, through the pump that way. It'll rinse out my filter. It'll go along this pipe here, down into the waste pipe and away and down into the drain might sound complicated it's really not once you've got your head around it and once once that's happened and this plate chill is rinsed clean we'll close this valve off and that will redirect the flow either through the pipe and the spray ball allowing us to rinse the tank out or I can close this and that'll direct the flow through the whirlpool arm and that goes in there and on the inside of the tank we have a we have a standpipe that goes down and points that way to create a whirlpool. So what we're doing, we're rinsing out all of this pipe work here at the minute. Once that's finished, and we'll open this valve back up again. In fact, we'll do it this way. So to clean this pipe out, I open this one here and I close off the top of the plate chiller. Now this again is cleaning that bit of pipe work. It's also rinsing out the pump and the pump inlet field filter. But we've got this bit of pipe here where it goes onto the boil kettle filter which doesn't get a rinse. So what we do is we close off both of the drain ports on the bottom and the only way for this to go now is through here and into the boil kettle. So we'll run that for five minutes, well a minute, and then when we've done that 
we open up these two valves at the bottom again and there she goes to waste so that's getting rid of the residual caustic in the tank and we'll do this for a little bit I might even take the hose pipe round when I'm finished as well open the lid and physically spray a few areas that I think haven't been touched quite with the rinse water and then we'll just add the acid to it and we'll do the same thing with the acid we'll push the acid through every single part of the pipework so everything has been sanitized before we use it for a brew day we've now got some water in the mash tun as you can see so we're going to add our acids then I'll just probably take a little bit of cold water just to rinse out any residual acids in the jug we want to make sure we get all of it there we go and then we need to mix the mash tun and of course try and hit our target temperature usually when I'm mashing in particularly as we're approaching winter which we will be doing in a month or two I like to overshoot the target temperature by one or two degrees because it's much easier to add a little bit of cold water to bring that temperature down but first we're going to mix it this is a modified plaster mixer I made this stainless steel adaptation for it and it fits straight into the screw thread at the top we're just going to dump this in it's been designed in such a way that at no angle can the whole thing be submerged below the full water line of the mash tun so we never get the motor it can't physically can't make contact with any liquids so we'll give this a mix if we're shooting for 65 degrees hopefully we'll come up at about 66 67 and then I'll just fill up one of my buckets with cold water we'll add it bit by bit maybe half a bucket at a time until we bring that temperature back down to exactly where we want it and when we measure the temperature we're using this long probe which goes to sit in the center of the mash and when it's in there I'll swirl it around side to side like this I won't keep it in one space and then what it's doing it's getting a general reading over a slight area to give me um, an average temperature rather than hitting hot spots and cool spots and then that's the temperature that I'll note down on the paperwork right the mash tun's filled I haven't got it to temperature yet but just quickly I'm going to show you what I normally do to cope with the fact that my HLT is too small so we need around 450 475 litres for the sparge we've got 375 in there at the moment not enough so what I tend to do is I've got another water meter attached to the cold main which goes into the tank there so we're going to add another 100 litres if you can just see there into the top of the mash tun whilst it's on and it's been recirculated and the 60 minute mash is just about enough time for me to bring the temperature of that water back up to 78 degrees because after I've added 100 litres of cold it might not knock it down to 70 or 65 when that's finished this meter will turn off on its own I had to install it because in the past I was doing it manually with a lever valve and I'd often forget and fill the tank up right to the top and it would take far too long to get up to temperature and we'd end up doing a two hour mash because we had to wait for it so I'm going to quickly um, get some cold water in here get it down to the temp today's temp is 68 we mashed in at 78 so if I just drop in the probe you'll be able to see that we're probably overshooting considerably if we want 68 I'll just bounce it around a little bit I know I said I move it side to side but I can't with one hand so we're about 68 point well about 69 I'd say that might even show 70 if I move it around a little bit so we're going to add a little bit of water get it down to 68 on the nose and then it's time to take a pH reading and if we're not happy with the pH we could also add a little bit more lactic if we needed to just to bring that pH down to around 5.2, 5.4 5.6 is often acceptable as well 
So if like us you're using uh, Persid 5 or Persid 15 to treat your tanks for sanitation it's probably worth picking up a set of these test strips. I'll show you the container that they come in. I think they're available from Murphy's and Niche and uh, places like that, Niche Solutions. And uh, what they do is measure the milligrams per litre or parts per million of your acid concentration. Very simple dip test and we found that we were using way too much acid in our mix. So I'm going to put one squirt of this Persid 15 into a 20 litre bucket and we'll see where we come with the milligrams per litre but I think I wrote it on the back of the... We want to be between 175 and 250 parts per million. So I'll see if I can do this one-handed. I don't know if I will be able to or not. Possibly. Right, there we go. So just prime the pump and then that's the equivalent of one full pump of acid for me. We'll just let that trickle out of there a little bit. And then what I normally do, just to agitate the acid into the tank, into the vessel, the bucket, just like that. And it also rinses off any splashes as well that we've got. And I've got a little stirry stick here, but if you're dumping this straight in, you shouldn't need it. I'm just gonna stir it so we can read what our little test strip says. So here's the little test strip. Just wants a two second dip in there, more than enough. And as you can see, it has indeed gone brown. So if we line it up with what color we think it is, you can see there that I was still a bit overzealous. And indeed, we're looking at closer to 300 parts per million. It's just not focusing very well at the moment. There we go. So 300, 250. As I said, it's between those two. So that little pump and a half, if you like, was too much. So we're at the top end of what we need. It just shows you how little Persid 15 is required to go into uh, a bucket of water to sanitize a tank. And the reason we go for the 15 is because the bucket lasts us longer, but just bear in mind that it does degrade over time. So if you're not getting through it, it's also a good idea to have a set of these strips just so you can make sure that your Persid is viable. Now, Persid doesn't work with its pH. It works as an oxidizer, and uh, that's the way it destroys bacteria, viruses, and all that kind of thing. Um, it doesn't... You, you can't measure its pH to see whether it's still effective or not. So just bear that in mind. You need to get yourself some of these acid test strips. So this often happens on a brew day. Let me just turn this off and I'll explain. So we've got the acid recirculating in there. And of course we've come to the end of the mash. Now, uh, we've just had a delivery. This is what I have to contend with sometimes. Um, because I'm... Well, we don't have the uh, staff in the kitchen start until later on in the day, obviously. They're on a different shift pattern to what I'm on. And what often happens is we get deliveries of frozen food or beer or whatever else. And I'm the only person on site, which means I have to deal with it while I'm also in the middle of brewing a beer, which can be a bit tricky. I think that's the wrong pipe I've just put on there, but we'll see. So what I'm doing now is I'm hooking up the pipe work, probably in the wrong order. I think that's, yeah, that's that's the one for the bottom. Um, and this is to recirculate the mash. Now, normally I don't have the pipes on the floor, obviously, because I've got two hands to do this, but we're still the wrong side of the hot side. So it's gonna be safe in terms of hygiene. Uh, but yeah, a couple of pipes to be installed to this little pump that I have at the side of the plate chiller and that just allows me to 
recirculate the mash to, sorry, <laughs> to clear the grain out. So what I normally do with my spar arm, because it's a copper pipe style, don't want to block it up with little bits of grain. So I just pull off the pipes, they're all lined up, taps open, let's turn the mash pump on. And you'll see that we've got beer flowing, and then we're just going to throttle it back so we don't create any suction on the grain bed. And we'll leave this for another 10 minutes. Now, in that 10 minute period, what I'm going to do is disconnect the pipe up at the top of the boil kettle into which I've been recirculating the acid through the spray ball inside. There she is. So we're going to take all this off and oh that's going to be tricky to do one handed as well so we'll take the spray ball off we'll take the pipe off and we'll change this round I'm surprised at quite the angle that that spray ball was at actually um, anyway I digress now this pipe here is a ventilation pipe to allow the kettle to draw in air if it needs to and that goes down at the side of the condenser flue so if we do get a boil over it just fires it straight down into that overflow bucket there which drains away so this is an intake valve if you will not so much an overpressure valve because if we do get a boil over the majority of it will find its way through the condenser flue this just allows it to breathe so we don't build up a vacuum inside now the reason for that is if you've got a vacuum in here and you open this lid and the um, condenser flue will cause a vacuum if it doesn't have the ability to draw in extra air to compensate for what it's removing. Um, when you open this lid, if there's a vacuum drawn, then the wort inside sees a different pressure and it immediately boils. And that means that you're in danger of getting covered in hot wort. So that's a little safety device there as well. Um, but what I tend to do if we've got any big hop additions or anything like that we will kill the heat to the elements before we open the lid and put anything in so I'm just going to get this pipe work across here now usually I've got a bucket waiting around for me like that we'll just stick the pipe in the bucket I normally hold it but for what it's worth it doesn't make much difference and we'll turn the pump on and we'll start flowing there we go so we are finished for the day so I'll open this I'll close this and I'll close this and what I've done there is I've locked in Persid in the plate chiller until we need it and I'll also lock it into this pipe as well until we need it but first I just need to empty the tank of Persid. I do hope you can hear me. This is going to be a long video so you know grab a beer and uh, fill your boots but I'll try and keep it as short as possible. This is the busiest part of the day actually. Everything hot side and before hot side. When we get to the cold side all I have to do now while we're transferring and boiling I'll fill this tank up with caustic. I'll give it a caustic We'll rinse it in a very similar fashion to how we rinse that tank and then we'll put some acid in to recirculate it and we'll drain that all out and then that's ready for the beer to just be pumped into and when it's pumped in there we just add the yeast, we add Brewer's Clarity to help um, with gluten content and the, any haze because we don't use any animal products, no Isinglass finings so this is one component of our finings regime and uh, we'll also add a tilt to monitor the gravity throughout the fermentation process turn the controller on to regulate the temperature and then when we're about close to finishing fermentation we'll up the temperature to 21 degrees for a diacetyl rest a couple of days at 21 and then we'll drop it down to about 16 and we'll start our dry hop regime but I've still got to finish this off so I turn the pump off there, I close the valve, and now we've got this isolated um, brewery hose. 
and it's got persid in it still so what I like to do is just cap it prevent any any bugs or anything getting in there and then I'll just I've not put that cap on right there we go then I'll just hook that up on there and that can sit there waiting until we are ready to recirculate through the plate chiller and remove that person and I'll generally tend to do that about 10 minutes before the end of the boil just before the protoflot goes in and then we'll bring the plate chiller up to temperature which is about 98 99 degrees that again provides us a second layer of sanitation but it also pushes out all the remaining persid in the pipes so the red pipe is full of persid as is the sight glass the plate chiller is full of persid and this bit of pipe work is here as well and down here also so what we want to do is empty that so i'll open the bottom any persid that's left in the pipe work drains then and then we've got our filter here and we're just going to pop off the tri-clamp pull it out and you see the filter's picked up any remaining bits of floaties that have been buzzing around generally just come over to the sink we'll wash them off not, bo not bothered about sanitizing this again because it's going to see the boiling work just needs rinsing off that's perfectly fine make sure that the seals in good condition and then we'll go back over to the filter we'll pop the seal on if you've got one of these filters when you put them in it's a good idea to just give them a twist instead of shoving them straight in it just helps seat that bottom gasket and then we'll get the tri-clamp back on always difficult to do with one hand in fact I don't normally do it this way but we'll get it on no doubt here we are and now that whole system after we've closed this is ready to receive the work after I'm happy that it's clear enough on this vol off and we'll start transferring into the boil kettle as soon as the liquid inside the boil kettle gets above the elements and above my little safety feature here which prevents me turning them on unless liquid is above them I put them on immediately and that is so we can get up to boil temperature as quick as possible in order to shorten the hour spent on a brew day so I've got my trolley ready for the spent grain to be dug out once the mash tun is drained and what I'm also going to do now is uh, caustic these tanks but before that happens I'm just going to come up to the back of the fermenters where we have our chillers located there's two chillers here and we're going to turn on the chiller for four and five and what that's going to do is it's going to get the unit down to temperature so when we put the beer in we've already got a cold bank of glycol in case we need to do a little bit of extra chilling in the tank because the cooling water going through the plate chiller in summertime is sometimes not quite cold enough now it's probably worth showing you my little manifold that i put onto the bottom of the tanks in order to allow me to clean so we just have these rjt fittings coming out the bottom of each tank and onto that i've just put a t with three female liners and nuts on there one of them goes to a blank with a lever valve on and the other one goes to another ball valve I'm just spraying this down for lubrication rather than sanitation at this stage but yeah this goes to another ball valve which sits along the front like this and what that does it allows me to lock in I can open this valve here then you see so whatever's in the tank can fill this little T-piece here and go through this pipe work so we can suck out of there into our pump which has a split inlet and a split outlet so one side of the pump will be connected to the mains well actually I've got a bowser but connected to a, a, a tank of water 
The other side will be connected to the tank that I'm cleaning. And then on the outlet, we've got two outlets here that can go one of them to the spray ball housing up at the top and the other one can go to the takeoff port halfway down the tank or near the bottom. So the routine is we put caustic in the tank, the caustic flows out of that side pipe there into the pump, out of the pump, back into the tank via the spray ball. Bearing in mind if your tanks are sealed you need to have some ventilation there so I don't connect this pipe up straight away because if the tank gets warm it will either explode or implode depending on what you're doing and something to bear in mind as well if you've got co2 in your tank after fermentation and you use something such as a caustic the caustic the sodium hydroxide will scavenge the carbon dioxide and create a vacuum inside the tank and i've seen tanks implode because of that so you need to make sure that your tanks are always vented to the atmosphere but either way we're going to recirculate through the pump into the spray ball then once we've done that we can attach to the inlet or outlet port and we can do the same thing there and recirculate the caustic through that also making sure that these are cleaned and drained because they are um, hidden points for the spray ball to see and then what we'll do is we'll close that side we'll drain the caustic out of the tank and we'll open up the water, the cleaning, the rinse water from the Bowser or the RBC, whatever you want to call it. And then we'll burst rinse. So five or six bursts of around 30 seconds a pop, allowing the tank to drain completely in between to rinse out all the residue of the caustic. We'll do the same through the takeoff port. We'll make sure, again, that there's no caustic in these little uh, hidden areas, making sure that all the caustic's completely removed from the tank and then we'll put acid in and we'll do the same thing with the acid. And then the final thing is to disconnect everything and allow the acid to drain. We'll close off the bottom valve and we'll fill the beer in through the takeoff port at the end of the brew day. And then up at the top, we'll remove the spray ball from the top and we'll add, I don't know if you can see one anywhere, maybe up here, we'll add, um, a little CO2 pipe which is not working under pressure just gravity so what happens is um, in fact I'll show you it'll probably be easier we have these top fittings which allows us to put ingredients in or drop a tilt in or whatever else and on top of those we have this pipe attached to the CO2 tank just on around 5 psi and there's no there's no gasket in there so it's not making an airtight seal this just sits in as you can see it moves around so this acts as our blow-off valve because once it's seated bugs can't get in they can't get past the metal on metal contact um, but what can happen is gas can burp out without any problem whatsoever and then once we finish fermentation and there's no CO2 being produced by the beer anymore. We'll open this valve here, and this valve is on a timer and a regulator here, a little solenoid valve. And every two or three hours, it will give a 10 second burst of CO2 into the tank, meaning that we're always keeping a bed of CO2 in there and preventing any oxida ox oxygen ingress or oxidation of the beer. Hopefully, it doesn't always work, but that's the plan. And that's what we do because we don't have sealed vessels and uh, we have to work with these open top ones. It's the best I can do with it, actually. So just to give you an holistic view of how the pipe works set up, we've just got one of these rigid pipes and all we do is just pop that in the drain like that and that runs off. So when we drain the rinse water, the caustic and the acid at the end, it all goes down into our municipal sewer and away and then this tank is clean and bright and ready to see some fermentation action we're at the point now where we want to transfer our beer across into the ferment uh, the boiling tank excuse me so we make sure that all our valves are configured as we want them yours setup might be different 
make sure our drain valves closed. I've done that before and put half a uh, hectolitre of beer down the drain. And what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect our recirculation supply and we're going to attach it to our boil kettle, making sure the valve on the boil kettle is closed. And we're going to get our sparge water supply, which is here, and we're going to attach that to our sparge arm. Now a couple of things to note when, when I've done this, and I'll talk you through them as we go. So come over here, I've already done it, but one thing you've got to make sure you do, turn off your HLT, you're about to empty the tank. So turn the HLT off completely. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to push any grain out of that sparge arm or any residual sugars. So I'm going to close my recirculation supply on the HLT, meaning that the pump only has one way to go now, and that's through this solenoid into the mash tun. Of course, we've got a water meter on here. So what I do, I press clean and clean just removes the numbers and then we'll press run. So now that will run continuously without stopping through there and into the mash tun. So just a couple of seconds to rinse it. Then I'll close the uh, valve on the top. We'll pop our sparge arms into position like so and then we'll open them up test them for the angle that we want them to be at that looks good to me but that's probably a little bit fast so we're going to throttle that down for now but we're going to come back to that in a second so now we also come over here and we're going to turn our mash pump back on again so the mash pump is taking the wort out of the bottom of the mash tun through this pump and into here so I, I tend to throttle this and control the flow of wort into the boil kettle using this valve. So we'll just crack it a little bit to get it started. And if we come around, we'll see the wort flowing into the tank. There it is. Now that looks like it's uh, just probably a little bit on the slow side. So I kind of know where I want to be with this valve and it's usually around there. Oh, and that's much more powerful flow. It's difficult for you to see, but it's flowing in anyway. Trust me. So once you've got that flow set, and this is an important aspect of the whole process, you can't draw the liquid out of your mash tun any faster than that liquid can percolate through the grain. If you do, you'll compact the grain bed and it'll stop flowing, it'll gum up, it'll become a stuck mash as we call it. So we want to see that as uh, slow as possible really. To drain a mash tun like this, it might take me 70 to 80 minutes. Don't rush it. This can really wreck your brew day if you do get a stuck mash. And then once you, you're happy with the takeoff rate, you want to maintain a couple of inches of water above the grain bed. So we don't touch that anymore. That's set. What we're going to do is we're going to open and close the sparge water and adjust the rate of flow into the tank rather than adjusting the rate of flow out of the tank. And that allows us to make sure we maintain an even and steady flow through the grain, rinsing as much sugar as possible out of those grain husks and also preventing us getting a stuck mash which I'll reiterate once more you do not want I've had many a time so as soon as the level of the work comes up into the boil kettle above my elements I'll come over here I'll turn my heating elements on to full on 100% and we'll let that get up to temperature as quick as possible once we get to a, a boil, I'll throttle it down to about 40% for me. Your brewery will differ, of course, just so we can maintain a rolling boil, and then we'll proceed with any hop additions that we've got to go into the tank. So as you can see, we're about to reach a boil, 
and it's at this stage I'll add some anti-foam now the trick with this anti-foam is uh, getting it into solution initially it's very uh, <laughs> well its consistency is not very attractive shall we just say so the idea is you want to mix it as much as possible with just a few mil of water it's kind of like wallpaper paste it gets thinner and thinner and uh, gradually it will disperse into probably around five or six hundred mil of water maybe a liter actually with what I've got here and then we're going to add that to the boil kettle with the whirlpool arm running and that will prevent us having any serious boil overs during the hot break and uh, allow us to utilize maximum capacity from our boil kettle without being too concerned about uh, foam boiling up through the chimney and whatever else. So in the background you can hear Gemma giving the fermenter a uh, few burst rinses so you'll hear the pump on and the pump off, the pump on, the pump off and it'll continue like that for a while. So I'm going to turn, this is rigged up for a uh, whirlpool, I'm going to turn the pump on and if we go up and have a look through the top we shall see that there's quite a bit of foam there so as soon as this stuff goes in you'll, you'll notice that foam practically disappear it really works quite fast so the whirlpool's kicking in now and the anti-foam it's just about doing its job. There's just a little bit left over there. But that, that'll be gone in a second or two. There we go. Works an absolute treat. So what I'm doing now is we're going to continue to recirculate. I'll rinse this jug out, of course. We're going to continue to recirculate. And what that's going to do is... The first lot of work that came out of the mash tun is obviously sat at the bottom of the boil kettle and uh, it's really quite concentrated stuff so we want to get that stuff up in circulation so we get a more consistent product and once that's done which it about is I don't want to close this off because I don't want to be bringing liquid out of that bottom port because when I put my dry hop, uh, my hop addition in it'll be pulled straight into the pump filter so we're going to take off on the side instead using this port here, this arm so we need to prime this arm so the pump is in full flow it's sucking through this quite large outlet we're going to shut it off completely and force the liquid to go through here so if you listen you'll tell what I've done you hear the tone of the pump has changed because it's now pulled maybe an airlock out of here or something. But if you give it a moment, it's now starting to be fed through this pipe work and into the pump. And any second now, there we go, you'll hear it start to build back up and continue to uh, recirculate, but now using the side takeoff arm. There we are, we're about there. Yeah, lovely. So the next stage is now, we're gonna wait till we hit a boil, wait till we've gone past hot break. Then we're gonna add our first edition of hops. Right, so I've stopped the sparge. I think there's enough water in there now to complete uh, my transfer to take me to the required volume in there. There's no point pumping more water into here just to achieve um, what my recipe says is going to be my sparge, required sparge volume simply because I think there's enough in there and if I keep going then I'm just going to have to wait for it to drain off anyway before I dig the mash out. So we've turned the, um, 
sparge off a little bit early. We've got seven, 472 litres, if you can make it out there. It said 540, but you know, sometimes things work out a little bit differently. You know, I did add some water to cool it down, didn't I, when we mashed in. So that needs to be taken into consideration as well. Uh, little things like that. So I've turned off the mash pump. I've isolated the supply. This is just going to sit here till next time. I've opened up the recirculating arm. So when we come to do our cool and transfer into the fermenter, we're going to capture the heat from the heat exchanger and we're going to fill the, mash, uh, the HLT back up again. So then for tomorrow's brew, we can recycle that energy that we've expended today in heating that water up initially. Another noisy section, unfortunately. So Gemma's doing me a big, big favor in digging out the mash tun. And at the moment I'm recirculating again through the whirlpool arm, but it's now time to clear out the parasitic acid we've got in the plate chiller. So we're gonna isolate these whirlpool arms here and here and we're going to open up to go into the plate chiller first i'm going to just pop the top off of my um pipe work which you'll recall i isolated earlier on there we go and normally i'm doing this two-handed so i'm just going to hold this between my legs sailor so we're going to open the back of the plate chiller, the front of the plate chiller, and then as I open this valve here, we're gonna see the acid come out of there, and you'll also see the acid coming through here. Try and get them both in shot. There we go. So we're sending the acid out of the plate chiller, and you'll see in the sight glass, the acid's coming out. Then it's just changed over to beer. So the trick is to time this right. But when that turns to beer, like it just has done, we turn it off. I've made a bit of a mess, but for the sake of the video, we'll cope with that. Then we're gonna hook it up to the boil kettle, just like that. Open that valve and uh, just pop some safety pins in the cam lock to prevent any nasty accidents because we are dealing with boiling hot work now and you've got to be careful and now we're going to open this there she goes so now we're flowing out of there in through the pump filter out of the pump through the plate chiller up through, out the top here, out of there, through the brewery hose, and back in to the top of the tank. And you'll see we're bringing the temperature of the plate chiller and the pipework up to about 98, 99 degrees, giving it some more sanitation and uh, getting it ready for chilling the work down after we've added our protoflock we've done the whirlpool we've done the whirlpool stand let everything settle out in the kettle and then we'll start to transfer hopefully reducing down to a nice probably 20 22 degrees now this is usually a little bit tricky we've got five protoflock tablets that i want to put in here and this will be boiling as you can see but the temperature will just be a little bit lower because we've gone through that plate chiller so i've got a minute's grace i'm going to pop them protoflox in there as you can see immediately they've flashed into uh nothingness we'll close that lid and we'll turn off the recirculation once it's hit 90 degrees because we don't want to agitate the whole thing too much we want that protoflox to do its thing and then once we've chilled, we're gonna to want to leave it all to settle so the protoflock can react with all the proteins and settle to the bottom of the tank, ready for us to transfer off the top of it and leave it all behind. Oh, it's warm in here. So now we're chilling the beer down and uh, 
according to the control panel were at 83.7 degrees but that's not entirely true and that's because what we're doing is we're sending the liquor through the plate chiller the work through the plate chiller and it's coming out and it's coming back into the top of the tank so we're going to have a little bit of stratification throughout this tank meaning that uh, we're basically taking beer out from the bottom and putting it back into the top colder so the cold level is going to come down a little bit like this so what I like to do halfway through is close off that valve that's going through the pipe, the brewery hose, and open the whirlpool valve. And what's going to happen is the beer is now going to start moving around. And more often than not, that's when we start to see a change in temperature on the, uh, on the boil kettle quite dramatic actually because it's mixing that cooler work with the not yet cooled work that is traveling slowly down um, down the tank if you like and also while all this is going on of course we're collecting the hot water it's coming in through here into the HLT as you can see we're already at about 175 litres over there all we want to do is get this down to 80 degrees so we can stand it still for a whirlpool uh, for 30 minutes. The beer was recirculating as you can see there at 43, 43.9, 42.9, 43 should I say. And now we've opened that other valve, you see we've very quickly got to 80. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the cold water. So now it's just recirculating and that will allow us to get an even uh, homogeneous temperature throughout the tank because we're getting some hop utilisation you see from uh, this Whirlpool addition and if I go and reduce it any much more than 80 degrees which is what I've set my target at then we're going to get less bittering from those particular hops and of course if it's higher we'll get more so it's important to try and Keep the whirlpool temperatures the same. I've missed them in the past and it's not been too noticeable uh, because this isn't a huge hop addition for the bitter but nonetheless it will make a difference in the bit in the final beer. So I'm just going to let this recirculate through there. Get a good whirlpool going as well now that this valve's open. So it's coming in and it's it's really starting to rotate all the beer in that tank and then when I'm happy that this isn't going to change anymore and it's leveled out you know anything above 79 degrees is fine then we'll go in with our final addition of Golding's hops to give this best bitter some of its aroma and flavor so we're still at 79.4 it's been on for a few minutes I'm happy with that let's just uh, go up to the boil kettle lift the lid and have a look what kind of whirlpool we've got established oh quite a good one actually so if you watch these hops going in around they go that's because we are indeed whirlpooling and give it a minute they'll all come back on the other side which is exactly what we want to see now an important point to remember here is we don't want to be turning that pump back on for the next 30 minutes because what we're going to do is we drag all of these hops into the filter which means it would block up the filter and we'd have to unblock it and it puts time on the brew day there's a potential to introduce pathogens or infect, infect, infect the beer maybe not pathogens but you know what I mean uh, introduce contamination so we're going to let these hops sit in there at uh, 80 degrees thereabouts and when we decide to hook this pipe up to the fermenter we want to make sure that that whirlpool arm is closed the only one that we're going to open is this one so we can send the beer across into the fv now we've got 30 minutes here so i'll come across we'll set this for 30 minutes and press reset while I'm here as well, good practice is we've got our boil isolated, but I also turn off the
the elements because sometimes with solid state relays you do get a little bit of leakage current going through there and uh, you can burn your elements out like that because remember these elements are now going to be exposed when we drain the wort out um, there's no reason why I can't do this now while we're waiting um, we've got acid in the tank so we've got a 30 minute whirlpool stand so I'm going to recirculate the acid through this tank to uh, make sure it's had a good 15 minutes or so to sanitise the inside of it and then we'll open all the ports let all the acid drain out and then I'll come back and hook up the transfer hose to this inlet and we will put the beer in there followed shortly by the yeast and anything else that we need to put in so we'll just open these connectors here is that attached to a spray ball jam it looks like it is to me let's fire her up there we go we are cleaning just this little clip here to go on keep the lid down now if I put my hand here I can feel a draft outside coming out of this tank. That's why it's really important, as I said earlier on, to make sure that all your tanks are open to atmosphere whenever you're recirculating any products inside them to prevent implosion and explosion, which are both catastrophic for the tank, but one of them could be catastrophic for you. Now, while you've got your whirlpool on the go, you're going to find yourself at a loose end. You could do some cleaning up. If you've not dug the mash tun out yet, you could dig the mash tun out. But we've already done that. So what I like to do is sort out my grain for tomorrow's brew. So I know I'm going to need around 70 kilograms of pale malt. So we'll pull that out. And we'll also weigh out any of the specialty malts that we might need. And... If you're very steady at, you know, preventing a massive dust cloud coming out of your tank, you can put all your grist for tomorrow's brew into your mash tun, ready to go. Save you a job in the morning. But just be aware that all that grain dust contains um, lactobacillus and possibly many other organisms that will spoil your beer. So if you don't think you can keep that grain dust to a minimum, and of course, you're gonna to have to wash your hands after you've handled any of those bags. Um, there is a huge potential of contaminating that lovely batch of beer that you've just made with some potentially unwanted organisms that will give you a sour beer in no time at all. So unless you're 100% sure, I wouldn't recommend doing it. You get your beer transferred, you get your yeast in and any other ingredients that you want to do, get your fermenter sealed, and then maybe you can go and put your grist into the mash tun. Sometimes I'll do it, sometimes I won't. I probably won't today. Um, and of course, you're not really going to have time to do it after you've transferred because you're going to be getting straight on with cleaning out your boil kettle, which is a real pain in the arse at the end of the day. So it all depends on how you're jiggling your time for your brew day as to what you're going to do next. So I've finished the acid sanitation of the tank. You can see down here that I've isolated that valve there. So all the acid's been sent down the drain. And uh, I've made sure that there's no acid trapped in this little section here. It's open to atmosphere still. We're going to hook up our transfer hose in a minute to that. But first... I like to make sure that I've rinsed my pump out, particularly if you're using one of these Clark pumps here, because it does have a brass fitting on the inside, which degrades. I buy extra impellers for these, so I don't have to buy a brand new pump. But it's also worth bearing in mind that uh, leave your acid in there, it's going gone, it's gone to brick your pumps eventually. So this is connected to my Bowser or IBC of fresh water, and I'm just going to open that valve and you can see it's running into the pump housing and out of what we had attached to the spray ball. So that's just shooting down there. Um, I can turn it on if I want to. I've already done it once, but I'm just doing this demonstration to show you how it's done. 
So we've cleaned out all the acid out of the pump housing. Next, we want to clean this pipe out and flush all this. It doesn't need to be done, but I like to do it. So we're going to open that valve. Now water can no longer make it up to this pipe. It's actually running round here, past my foot, into the little T-section that we had earlier, down there, and as you can see, away and down the drain. So I'm happy now that we've rinsed out our pump. All this can be closed off, can be disconnected, taken away. I'm just going to leave it there for now because it's it's sealed and isolated, it's not a problem. Then what we usually do, we take the whole assembly off there and we'll put it onto our next tank. And sometimes if you're saving caustic as well, if you've got clean tanks and you're just using the caustic to get rid of any kind of baked on dirt and debris, and you can go through two or three tanks, providing that there's no residual CO2 in the tanks because the CO2 completely destroys the cleaning effect of the caustic. So uh, these tanks have been disconnected, as you can see, just like these, open to atmosphere. I've been on holiday for over a week and there's definitely no CO2 in these tanks. So it's fine to reuse the caustic if you want to. So the plan is disconnect that assembly, plug it into that one, put a lid on, lather, rinse and repeat, as they say. So let's come over here now, continue with the brew day. Uh, I'm gonna isolate this supply Make sure as well that the uh, supply feed in this hose is isolated. We don't want any accidents. This is still at 80 degrees C and will burn. So we've disconnected the pipe and we're gonna bring this brewery hose across here and we're gonna hook it up straight to our valve on the front of the tank. We'll leave that open. Again, just double check that that's closed, which it is. I'm going to go up to the top of the tank now. And I'm going to remove the spray ball assembly, which is here. And I will be replacing it with one of these, but not this one. I'm going to get one that's been sat in acid first. Down here across to the sink and you can see I've started to gear up ready for the transfer there's one of those valves I was talking about now in here we've got the tilt that we want for that particular tank it's the pink one it's not showing up on the system yet though strangely enough I might have to check its battery I wonder if I lay it sideways like this it should shut off but we'll stand it up vertically. We'll have a look at that in a moment anyway. I'll change the battery if needs be. We've also got a little 10 mil syringe in here because we're going to be adding some Murphy & Sons Brewers Clarity. Now this stuff, as I mentioned earlier on, helps reduce the gluten content of the beer and also helps with reducing any haze. So I'm going to get my little fit in, pop it in there. I've also got some stainless steel tongs because I like to use this to lift things out with, particularly the tilt. Once it's been sanitized, I don't want to touch it with my fingers. So this is how I pop it through the hole in the top of the tank. Um, in fact, I'll check the battery on that before we go ahead with anything. And we've just got two more minutes until we start the transfer. So I could probably go forward and do it now. So what we want to do is turn on our cooling water again. The first little bit I just like to send out to waste so I'm not filling my tank up with cold water. We'll get that flowing around there. Make sure we're not gonna pump and recirculate back into the tank. We'll turn the pump back on and then we're gonna start to flow it through into the fermenter. You'll see that move in a second. There we go, look at that. Now what we're going to do is use this top thermo thermometer to track the temperature that it's coming out at and we're going to throttle back until we can make this maintain a steady 20 degrees into the FV. And also we'll be watching this for clarity. It'll be hazy for the first minute or two but we'll, we'll be watching this and hoping that it clears up slightly as the transfer progresses. 
in fact you can already see it's starting to clear up nicely now just a few minutes in look at that temperatures coming down now we'll start collecting this water into our HLT and of course the time has gone off to tell us that we need to start the transfer little beauty everything's going smoothly so while that's happening I'm gonna go and check the battery on that tilt would you look at that that's what a, a hop stand does for you by the way absolutely crystal clear lovely work so today is the 23rd of August and at this time of year the tap water is really quite warm and I'd be going at trickle if I wanted to get this to 20 degrees we're slowly getting down to about 25 so what I'm going to do is a little trick that I often use during the summer and we're going to use the fermenter to help bring the temperature of this beer down so there's usually a lag phase of 24 hours for the yeast that I use so that means that we can turn the fermenter on and within that 24 hours this fermenter will be able to get this beer down from 25 degrees and we'll ferment at about 19.4 I think today that looks about right so that's one of the reasons why I'm turning this on now so the chiller can work with us and combat this warm weather that we've got and this warm tap water that we've got as well just a little trick that I like to use so I'm quite happy putting my yeast in to the beer at 25 degrees. I've done it as high as 28, 29 before. That first four or five hours, the yeast is just waking up. It's not actively fermenting. So it's not going to produce any, if at all, it's not going to produce many, if at all any, should I say, um, fusel alcohols or esters or off flavours in that, in that first six to 12 hour period, I don't think anyway and this fermenter is more than capable at dropping that temperature from 25 down to 19 in less than an hour anyway so it's worth bearing that in mind if you are struggling don't worry too much about dropping your yeast in at a slightly higher temperature than what is recommended looking up at the system you can see we've got the pink tilt registering up there so in fact the battery didn't need changing but i do have some batteries ready to go if i did and a little tip to keep an eye on how um, fast your tilt's draining the batteries when you change them out just write the date on the side of the battery and you'll be able to see then how many months life you get out of it when you have to come around to change it again and if like me you have a whole bunch of tilts then it's really quite handy to keep track because I can never remember the last time I changed any of these out so it's just a nice little tip if you get to 12 months and you're not sure you're probably about ready for switching her out anyway so now I'm up here at the top of the tank and I've propped the phone on the adjacent tank to try and get a shot and show you what I'm doing so this is the uh, Brewer's Clarity we're ready to put that in now so that can go on into the beer during the transfer and also I've got my yeast so this is old English yeast from WHC labs and we bought this um, to experiment with and see if it was a viable substitute for Nottingham L yeast or SO4 which is our usual go-to brand and I wasn't particularly happy with it so I'm not going to recommend it but we do have few kilograms of it left in stock so of course we're going to use it up for the beers that we've uh, used it in in the past so I'm just going to team I'm just going to team this hope you can still see team this into the uh, fermenter through the little port that I've got on the top in fact I might just pick the phone up because I can see that it's probably not going to be the best angle over there so I'll just grab all of this try not to spill it everywhere because I'm looking through the viewfinder like a spanner there we go now the reason I'm not too keen on this yeast is it tends to have uh, a tendency to 
stay in suspension a little bit longer than I'd like. And of course, this is a Harrison's Best Bitter, so I would like it to be as bright as possible. And we're contending with the fact that we're not using any isinglass finings, so we really need the yeast to play a big part in helping us get a bright and polished beer. So the next thing I'm going to do is grab my tilt from out of the Persid. There he is. And we're just going to drop him into the FV, just like that. And then finally, we've got our cap. We'll pop that on top there as well. And I can feel, if I put my hand on the top, I can feel the air coming out of the tank where obviously the beer's displacing it. And then we'll come over here, just check I've got the right one. This one here. And then we're gonna get our CO2 inlet or our airlock, if you will. Give it a bit of a dip in the acid because it's been sat on the top of that tank, might be dusty. Then we'll pop it in. No O-ring, remember, just sat under gravity. No bugs or flies or anything can get in there, but gas can easily burp out to prevent the tank from exploding. So that's it. All that remains to do now is to take some readings. We'll take a pH reading, we'll take a gravity reading, we'll record that on the sheet, and then we're gonna to have to set about cleaning the boil kettle which is my favorite job in the world. So cleaning down the boil kettle is always quite a tricky process. What I tend to do is disconnect the transfer hose once the transfer is finished, and I hook it up to the HLT, because the HLT has got hot water in it. So we're pumping hot water through the transfer hose, and then that's going through the plate chiller, and it's rinsing out the plate chiller, and it's rinsing out the pump, most importantly, and it's getting the sugars off those seals with hot water. Now I've done it in the past where I've just run cold water through and what happens is it thermally shocks the pump and can crack your seals. And of course, also if you start it, right, you leave this till tomorrow and the sugar dries on those seals, you start the pump, it will ruin your seals. It's very important to make sure you clean your pump with hot water after a brew day, no thermal shocks, no letting it dry out overnight. It needs to be done every time you've, you, uh, you've brewed a beer. So we've got hot water going through. We're gonna put hot water into the bottom of the boil kettle, and we're gonna give the whole thing a rinse with some hot water first. So I've done the same thing in reverse. We've sent hot water through everywhere. I'm just gonna close this bottom valve up, and what we're gonna do is redirect this water, excuse me, we're going to redirect this water up through the standpipe in through the whirlpool arm. Over here, you saw all that water running out the front of the pump because I've taken off the filter. Now this is all hop debris that the filter has picked up. As you can see, it's not completely blocked, which is good news. So all I do is just run it under the hot water and all of this stuff just comes straight off. Uh, we're trying not to push it further into the wedge wire. We want this, this stuff off, not in, if you know where I'm coming from. And it's a little bit difficult doing it one-handed, but you kind of get the impression. So I'm just gonna go all the way around here now. I might as well do it on camera, because I've started. And it's handy to just rinse out the center as well, because there will be some bits in there, look, you can see. So we want to make sure that this is completely clean. And then we're going to put this back in. And of course, when we recirculate the hot water and then finally the caustic, it's going to be this little guy that does the same thing and traps any more little particles of anything that might be in there and prevents it going into the pump because we want to keep our pump free of any large pieces of debris. This is a three quarter of a millimeter or 750 micron filter and that keeps anything out that the pump might struggle to cope with. Anything smaller than that 
it's not too much of a problem. There we go. Again, one-handed tri-clamp operation. Not my finest hour. And I'm doing it left-handed as well, which makes it even more difficult. So now what I'm gonna do is we'll open this back up again so it goes down into the pump area. We'll close this off. And now we're gonna rinse through this little dead leg of the standpipe comes out the front. Water's coming in, it's got nowhere else to go. It has to fill this pipe up, it has to fill this pipe up, it has to travel in here. So we'll just rotate this ball valve a little bit, make sure that's been nicely cleaned. Then we're just gonna pump about 20 liters into the tank. Then what I'll do is I'll take this hose off and I'll connect it to the spray ball, which I've already installed in the top of the tank. We'll recirculate, we'll drain all that water away. Then I've got two buckets of hot water here, which I'll add some caustic to. We'll throw them in the tank. We'll set them to recirculate on the spray ball. And then what I usually do is I get this analog timer. Very, very handy indeed. Because uh, I could do it with this, but I, uh, I have that set to come on in the morning for tomorrow's brew day for the HLT. So we'll just set this for about an hour. We'll plug it in and then this will recirculate that caustic for me while I'm not here. Don't have to worry about turning the pump off. Tomorrow we'll rinse that caustic out the tank. In the meantime, we're gonna set this up so it comes on tomorrow morning. We don't know, of course, if there is enough water in there because I've used some for cleaning. So what we're gonna do is open the recirculation pipe. We're gonna hit this button here, which will top up the water after the little bit that we've just used. And then what we're gonna do is set everything to come on. So we've got the HLT pump to recirculate overnight. We want the HLT to come on, 78 degrees seems good to me. And the HLT lights, not necessary, but I tend to leave them on. Double check that the boils elements are both isolated and the HLT is on. We can see at the minute it's drawing 19 amps so we're just going to press this button here and that is set and ready to come on for tomorrow. So I've just taken a sample, I've taken the connector off there, in fact I just dropped it into my container, it's fine in there for a moment um, and then of course we're going to spray everything down with PAA, make sure that it's all nice and sanitised. Then we'll take this sample over to our testing area, if you like, and I'll just uh, pour a hydrometer sample into this trial jar. I'll turn the um, boil kettle cleaning CIP off so we can actually look at the results and uh, get them recorded. So there's our sample. We're looking for about 1039.1 to 1040.1. And we've got a uh, six, seven, eight, 1039. Point. Oh, it might be 1039 on the nose, that. Could be 1039 on the nose. Obviously we, uh, we don't include the meniscus which is that little rise of liquid that you can see you see how the liquid rises up to meet the glass we don't count that we read straight across the level so I'm going to say that's 1039.1 and then if we look at the pH we're sitting nicely in a shot glass of the booze at 4.78 so let's get that recorded and see where we want to be so yeah, 1039.1 is our minimum target, so one point, hold on a second, let's get it on the uh, 1.03, oh, sorry, 9.1, and then if we skip over the page, there should be, if I just come out of uh, narrow focus there, fermentation details, Gravity at 1.0391 and pH was 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 4.7, 
4.78 it's reading now so we'll write that down 4.78 and the temperature I'm going to guess that it's at 23 degrees C before we go over there let's just shove that in I said 23 didn't I oh well that's even better told you that this machine will do the job 21.7 so there we have it that's the beer in the tank everything recorded fermenting away nicely all that I need to do now is tell the tilt that that is the best bitter and I like to put guile numbers on there as well so we're going to use the guile number uh, 219 so best bitter 219 that will send a cloud report to me via my gmail account and all I need to do now is clean this trial jar turn on the boil kettle and uh, let it clean in place and I'll be back tomorrow for another brew day but I'm probably not going to do the same thing tomorrow this has been quite a uh, long and uh, conclusive video I'd have thought of how I run my brew days I've not done one of these for a while so stick around keep liking keep subscribing and there'll be more videos coming along soon i'll see you around cheers oh and you can't beat a nice walk with the dogs after a long hard day brewing see you on the next one folks go on then reggie go on chance go on lad good boys